Hello everyone and welcome to the show. You're watching In the Studio. I'm your host, Lynn Weaver. The program is brought to you by Davis Media Access and it broadcasts on Davis Community Television. That's Comcast Channel 15 and uh, AT&T UVerse Menu 99. We're also online at dctv.davismedia.org so please log on and check us out. Tonight, or today rather, uh, our topic is uh, a very special one. It's about mountaineering and we're going to talk with a Davis resident whose passion is to climb the highest peaks of every mountain and uh, he has a fascinating story to tell. So let's hear it. Uh, Tim Townsend, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here, for giving us your time. You indeed have a fascinating story to tell. So uh, I'm going to start asking you, first of all, June 7, 2003 is a very special date. Can you tell us why? Yeah, it wasn't my birthday. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, j j this past June 7th, 2013, happened to be uh, two things. It was the 100th anniversary of the first party to have successfully climbed Mount McKinley, Denali. And by chance, it was also the day that myself and my climbing partner, Andy Howell, climbed it. Fantastic. Um, the, uh, you speak mountain climbers generally talk about Denali rather than Mount McKinley. Why is that? And what does it mean? I think that uh, mountain climbers and others, and even the U.S. government now in the form of Denali National Park, out of respect for the locals in Alaska, the natives, the, yes. know, Alaska natives, yes. refer to it as Denali. That's not the only native name for the mountain, but it's probably the most popular one. Yes. And let's say going back 100 plus years ago, there were some mining prospectors that had wanted to name it after McKinley, having more to do with gold standard and... Nobody ever really liked the name McKinley being applied, so that's why there's this kind of, you know, out of tradition they call it McKinley, and the U National Geographic and the USGS call it McKinley, but most of the people who are there for any length of time prefer not to call it that. I, I understand, and, and that's very, I didn't know that, so that that's great. Um, can you tell us, I know that you attempted to uh, reach the top of Denali, six times, and then finally, on the seventh attempt, you reached the top. Uh, how did it feel? What did you feel when you got there? Well, I don't know. Um, in some respects, you feel like the person who failed at the bar exam 40 times and then finally passed, and uh, or maybe Diana Nyad, right, who tried to swim from Cuba to Florida five times, not okay. un unsuccessfully four times over like 30 years, and then finally just a few weeks after I was on Denali, she did it. So I feel some sort of a thin kinship to Diana and I had, in, in my case, it was the fifth attempt. There was a four, oh, sorry. four no, yeah. still a lot. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, one for five is not a very good batting average, but it sure beats 0 for five. Yes. Um, how did it all start? How did it, I, I understand that uh, it was perhaps over 17 years ago that it all, all started for you and your wife, Lisa? Yeah, that's right. Tell us about it. Well, you know, I suppose it's hard to articulate, but I think a lot of people have some sort of primitive satisfaction of climbing to the top of anything. I don't, you know, the mace overcrossing, you know, yes. whatever. We were in Texas, uh, 1996, doing a work assignment for about six months. West Texas. Yes. And a lot of people think Texas is hopelessly flat. A lot of it is. But the west part of the state is actually very mountainous. And there's a national park there called Guadalupe Mountains National Park. And so on a Cinco de Mayo weekend, we were looking for something to do. And in fact, one day we went to a really low plot, Carlsbad Caverns, in the ground. Next day we went to the Guadalupe Mountains Park right next to it and climbed up to the highest spot in Texas. And when we were up, it's about a two or three hour hike from the parking lot. Can you remember how many feet? Uh, Guadalupe Peak is about 8,700 feet. 8,700 feet, yes. At the top, we met a couple guys from L.A. And one of them had some ridiculous T-shirt on saying, 
you know, I was at the highest spot in Nebraska, and we just thought it was pretty funny. And they were having lunch up there and just eating McDonald's cheeseburgers. And I was like, this is great. You know, usually you think you just have to eat granola bars or suffer on the trail. There was, it was just such an absurd thing. That, and they were trying to go to as many state high points as they could. And they told us that they were members of this club called High Pointers Club. And they said, they got a funny newsletter. We'll send it to you. So we ended up summiting the high point of Texas that day, essentially just looking for something to do. And then after we were talking to these gentlemen from L.A., we were like, well, you know, we should go climb some more of these. They look like they're having fun. And we didn't immediately want to go find the highest spot in Nebraska. But little by little, I mean, we went and climbed uh, Mount Whitney in California on the way back from that trip. And then it just sort of cascaded from there. So, as I understand, the most in, uh, incredible thing is that you've uh, climbed the highest peak of each single state of the Union. And uh, you, I'm sure you have a lot of experiences and a lot of stories to tell. Uh, what would you say... Uh, so, so, do you enjoy climbing mountains? I mean, is it fun? <laughs> <laughs> it is. It, it, it is. There's and some why? sort of Can primitive you... rush that's hard to yes. describe. On one hand, seeing these mountains, as dramatic as they are, you don't want to say it too loud, but since we're on camera, we're saying it. I must say that the view from the bottom looking up is usually a little better than the view from the top looking down. The physical euphoria and the sense of satisfaction, like I said, almost at a primitive level, is undeniable. It's hard to articulate. It's just plain fun. Yes. Sometimes just, you know, the, the workout or the, the challenge of surmounting weather conditions or just getting through a difficult day becomes something particularly satisfying when you get back down to the trailhead. Some of them are tougher than others. They take multi-day backpack trips. Let's not kid ourselves. Some of them are not much of a technical challenge at all. There's probably a dozen of them that you just drive your car essentially right to them. Yes. But um, it, it's, it's very interesting because... Uh, Having climbed uh, 50, <laughs> at least 50 peaks, um, what kind of terrain uh, 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 did you encounter? Is it rock, ice? Is it uh, uh, crevices, uh, avalanches? Can you tell us a little bit? Because uh, some of these, uh, this terrain is, is very, very dangerous. Uh, and uh, tell us what are the worst enemies of climbing a mountain, of the mountaineer, rather? Well, all of the hazards you just mentioned, all of the above, um, avalanches, crevasses, falls, rock, tough weather. And, and weather, yes. Yeah. So there's probably only a handful, maybe five or six of the U.S. high points that would qualify as being those super difficult ones. Mount Rainier has a lot of crevasse danger. Mount Hood is difficult. People die up there almost every year. Really? Because of the crevasses or because of... There's one big crevasse. They call it a bird shrunt on Mount Hood. But Mount Hood tends to have a lot of falls. Oh. So falling on mountains is one of the significant hazards. Yes. And sometimes when people fall, they take out other people. Yes. So th that's... And they fall off because they are actually... Uh, Climbing on ice, or uh, yes, with uh, with studs. And Sometimes mix yes. ice and rock, and it's on steep terrain when it's icy. You usually put on these claws; they call them crampons, crampons that fit yes. onto the bottom of your boot, yes. and they make you bulletproof. You just think that it's no problem. They they really have a terrific bite. Yes. And so, sliding on stuff with crampons usually not uh, too big of a, a risk, but if the terrain itself is unstable then, you know, that's, that's probably the you more go significant with it. hazard. Yes. Yeah. And yes. a lot of people don't like to climb with crampons because they like the feel of a boot. And yes. you try and stay with a raw boot as much as you can until you absolutely need to go with the crampons because they're heavy. They're a couple pounds. And you kind of feel like Herman Munster walking around in them. But they, they really do grip well. And so uh, I'm pretty comfortable yes. climbing with crampons myself. Did you use them to climb uh, Denali? We did. Yes. Uh, the crampons on Denali are used extensively. I see. And almost exclusively, I think at every point when we were higher than about 11,000 feet, we were using crampons. So basically the upper half of the mountain, because the mountain is 20,000 and change. And I, we, we transferred from snowshoes to boots with crampons any, any point above about 11,000 feet. 
interesting. And Denali is roughly 20,000 yeah, feet, yeah. would you say, yeah, feet? And, uh, and that compares with uh, Himalaya being, is Himalaya the, the highest peak well, in the world? The Mount Everest is uh, about 29,000 feet. Yes. And there are a number, I don't know how many, there might be 100 peaks around the world, maybe even a little more, I haven't looked it up, that are 20,000 or higher. Higher. But yes. one of the things that's a little bit different about Denali that gives it an extra difficulty factor is that it's so far north that it's cold. Yes. A lot of people maintain that it's as cold or colder than climbing Everest. And even though it's not as high up in the air isn't as thin, when you get towards the poles, the... the atmosphere is thinner and so the physiological response to altitude is worse when you're at high and extreme high altitudes. I see, it, even though the height is not yeah. as... Uh, so the air, the air blanket over the earth is thinner and so the, there's less oxygen and it's the physiological equivalent of being at say 22,000 feet. Did you use any oxygen? Uh, Did not. There's no. emergency oxygen at a few places on the mountain. I haven't seen any, I just know that it's there. And the park service, hopefully. yeah, hopefully <laughs> we didn't check. Um, but at the fourteen thousand foot camp, there's a reasonably well stocked medical tent, and several rangers and volunteer medics. And from what I understand, there's a, essentially a good supply of emergency oxygen there. I understand there's a buried supply at the highest camp, which is at seventeen thousand feet, and then you're on your own. You're on your own. Yeah. The, the trick is to go up the mountain slow enough at about a thousand foot per day increase so your body can adapt, create enough red blood cells where you won't be starved for oxygen, your blood can saturate, and you won't need supplemental oxygen. It's fascinating. And we're going. I'm going to ask you a little more about your training and other um, semi-technical things, perhaps. But first, I wanted you brought some fantastic beautiful photographs of, of the mountains and I want our viewers to enjoy those and perhaps you can comment on, on them. So let me, sure. so there's the first one here and you are the gentleman on the left with that very interesting um, patch on your nose, right? Yes, this is sort of a <laughs> sore point with my wife, Lisa, who's has reminded me a few times why could you have not taken one picture without that nose guard on? <laughs> and who is the gentleman on the left? He's now, your uh, companion. A Andy Howell was a little smarter. He knew to took off his, take <laughs> off his nose guard. Well, when I got the nose guard, the salesperson at the mountaineering shop said that they're sexy. Oh, I see. So the reason I had it on is just because I thought By it was all sexy. Means. Yes, yes. Uh, so we have here a view, sort of like almost a mystical view of, uh, of Denali, isn't it? Pretty rare to see it that clearly. And this was the morning that we were leaving the mountain. This was June 9th. And so this was taken from the bush plain when it was maybe 500 feet out of the base camp. So, you know, we were at, it's at an beautiful. altitude of seven or 8,000 feet looking northward towards the whole, but the, the west buttress is the area that we climbed on the left side of the mountain. But you're looking at the south face of the mountain here. Uh, and here is you and with all the supplies going up to the top? That's right. What you do to climb this mountain is you carry an insane amount of gear. It's probably 125 pounds per person is pretty typical. Good. Yes. And so very few people can go up and down the mountain without having to stage it. So what's typical is you will drag some in a sled and then go partway up, carry half your gear partway up the mountain with the sled, return to their camp, and then go back and bring the rest up the next day. On this particular day, we were ferrying a load of supplies up to the 14,000 foot camp and had to spend a few hours going through some near whiteout conditions. So uh, from oh, here we are, uh, we see a crevice here. Is this on Denali as well? There are loads of crevasses on Denali. Yes. Lower down, um, when you go up earlier in the season, you can kind of walk right over them, may not even notice them there. Mm -hmm. And people are astonished if they come down the hill two, three weeks later that it's so rotted out. And sometimes you have to wait till middle of the night and cross on what remaining little snow bridges are there, or you have to walk long distances to go around. And so frightening. It, it is frightening. And at times, and the reason I put this picture here is that you might see the pattern of a hole on either side, 
And then the wands are often there to mark where you're supposed to walk for the trail. Yes. But the custom is that if somebody encounters a crevasse, is that they put a crossed wand. Well, you're so starved for information when you're walking, then you're so accustomed to walking towards the, the wand because that's where the trail is. And at one point, that's where the trail was until somebody punches through, and then they mark it with a double wand. And now you know you're not supposed to be there, but you're not sure where you're supposed to go. Oh, and goodness. you look up and down and you see that the thing has punched through it along, along a whole crack. And so that's why it can be pretty frightening at times Very when you're trying to navigate your way through the terrain. And of course, uh, uh, this is even without a whiteout, right? I mean, if you have a whiteout, then it's, it's tragic. When it's a whiteout, it's like you're living inside a ping pong ball. Yeah. And you're, you're taking your ice axe and waving it around and you're just trying to find where the next wand is. And out of tradition, people will put bamboo wands in about the equivalent of each rope length, which is maybe 150 odd feet. And so if you train your eyes to be looking, but the problem is, is a lot of the wands, they get blown over, they get knocked over. So they aren't always there. Yes. And sometimes they're there more frequently, but you become accustomed to that safety pattern of looking for the route and the wands. And, and that can lead to mistake. Just another quick question about the crevice uh, is how deep do they uh, tend to be? <laughs> you haven't checked. Haven't checked. <laughs> Hundreds of feet. But there's a wonderful man that used to live in Davis, Ed Derrick, who wrote a book called 6194 Denali Solo. And Ed climbed up Denali by himself twice. The first time he fell in a crevasse and he was only like 18, 19 years old. And he took photographs of his surviving the crevasse fall from 70 feet down where the crevasse had narrowed enough where his body and his gear came to a tumbled stop. And all the stuff was crunching down around him and didn't bury him. And then he had to shimmy his way out. And so I think it's the world's best photograph ever is actually in Ed's book. Oh, and again, the title of the book? The title of the book is called 6194, Denali Solo. And 6194 is the metric height of Denali. Oh, I, I understand. Well, that's great. Absolutely great. Uh, well, uh, here's another photograph. Um, and these are. Uh, this is the side of a mountain. And I believe that's you. This is a view from the summit, looking back down the ridge that we had just climbed up a little bit earlier. And so this view is generally, although at this point, maybe people don't care which way we're looking, but it's looking downhill and generally to the southwest. I see. Now, there is one thing that you said there. There's you uh, near the top. Now, this is the view that the previous photo was looking down this same ridge. And so this is when we were ascending the ridge. This is at about 8 p.m. at night. So you would think with as clear as it is there, oh, it must be noon, 1, 2 p.m. But since you're so far north and since it was so close to the summer solstice, this is approximately 8 p.m. We summited at 9 o'clock. So this is, you know, maybe even a little bit later, Nate. And here this is up at the summit at 9 o'clock, and it's just beautiful conditions. And we really lucked out because the winds were so low that we were conversing about like this. That's fantastic. You can talk up there, and that never happens. It's always, it's almost always very harsh, very windy, and we really lucked out in terms of being able to have moderately warm temperatures. It was only about zero degrees Fahrenheit and very low winds. And so luck played a bit of a part in, in your climbing uh, Denali, didn't it? I have to admit it, yeah. Yes. And you're, you're holding a um, ice axe there? I was redoing as sort of a joke when um, Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay first summited Mount Everest in 1953. Yes. The only photograph that was taken of that was not of Hillary, it was of Norgay. Yes. Taken by Hillary. I believe I've seen that, yes. And so the one photograph has become kind of famous in mountaineering, and Life magazine, you know, popularized it. Yes. So I was sort of joking, just, you know, redoing the Tenzing Norgay pose, yes. striking it the same way as my hero pose on the top. Oh, very, very nice. Uh, well, I uh, before I forget, I just want to mention that uh, Tim uh, has been featured in uh, on on uh, various times, uh, one uh, in the Davis Enterprise on December first uh, was beautiful feature article uh, on uh, on your adventures and uh, very nicely done with lots of details about the mountains that you've climbed. 
Uh, there were also you were featured on the uh, Chica Chicago Times, I believe, uh, the Sunday Times, uh, in and uh, you uh, that there again it was a, a very extensive feature about you and your adventures and your passion, and then of course you are a member of the High Pointer uh, Club. And uh, you'll have to explain to me what high point means and what is the high point shake. Uh, but uh, um, uh, you are a member of that club, and they have, um, in uh, one of their very recent uh, uh, newsletters, they have uh, also extensive coverage uh, uh, about you and photographs. So uh, how do you feel about becoming so well known? <laughs> 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 well, I, I think that my Warhol 15 minutes have long since been exhausted, for one. <laughs> Although I was very, very pleased that you had invited us in to be in the studio. Oh, it's an and honor it to have you. A, a real treat to not be freezing in a tent to be in the studio talking about it and reliving it. Well, well, I was thinking when I was coming here and preparing for the interview, and I was hoping that the interview for you would be like a leisurely walk along a plane rather than a... <laughs> arduous climb onto a mountain. I hope that that is still true. <laughs> that is true. But it's funny how your mind muffles out the bad things. You know, the times when your fingers are freezing and your, you know, legs are burning and you feel weak or you're sick because a lot of things go wrong. Your knees hurt. You, you feel altitude sickness. There's just any number of things that nagging things that collectively make you question your drive to go and complete to the top. Yes. But coming back to the handshake... Uh, can you explain that to me? Sure. Uh, well, for, the, the for high, the play, you know, for someone who doesn't yeah. know much about mountain the, the High Pointers Club has been around for about 30 years. And there are a couple hundred people, 250 people now, that have climbed to all 50 high points. It, it's not a condition of membership that you can have zero high points and belong to the club. I see. They well, that's invite reassuring. People, yes. <laughs> There's babies that are seven days old that have, can claim high points. <laughs> and the newsletter is very funny, and it gives tips on how to find different high points and relate some people's stories. And one of the traditions of the newsletter is that when somebody finishes the 50 high points, they invite them to share a little bit of their tale. Yes. And when I finished the 50, I was telling the editor, I go, I assume that I'll now be let in on the big secret of like the secret handshake for the high pointers. <laughs> and it turns out there wasn't a secret handshake, so we, we made one. And so, so our secret high pointers handshake is basically a modification of a high five. Yes. So it's the shape of a mountain. Ah, uh -uh. you but, started a tradition there now. <laughs> yeah, they had some fun with it. But the only twist would be that the person who is higher up on the completers thing, this is where it gets a little complicated. Oh, is I see. That you, one person holds their hand out in the, in the five and the other person in the zero so that together the clasping of the hands and the high five becomes the symbolic 50. Oh, how wonderful. So that's the, the variation on the high five. Interesting. Yeah. Well, listen carefully, you uh, wannabe mountaineers. <laughs> that's a very nice thing to yeah, know. Yeah, that one may not ever get any traction, but it was fun. <laughs> yeah. um, your wife, Lisa, has been very supportive since from the beginning and has been climbing with you a lot. Uh, how does she feel about climbing now? Well, I don't know if you could say she's supportive. She usually was in front of me, so okay. um, she's the <laughs> she's a she's her. a much better climber, <laughs> and she tends to be way in front of people. Um, yeah, no, she was terrific, uh, especially after I had gone to Denali the first time. There's a lot of trepidation of going into a place where people die every year, and you always think that you're smarter and better and luckier, and which is exactly why people die. Yes. But I always promised her that I, I didn't promise her I'd get to the top. I just promised her I'd get to the bottom. And the first trip that we were there, it was uh, too much for an inexperienced person. We recognized that. The weather was really harsh. So we turned around. So you have that kind of nagging disappointment. And then, you know, a series of excuses for bad weather, et cetera, on different trips. And so she never really was, you know, the one that, was saying, you should stop doing this. It's she too expensive, you. and you're going to get hurt. She she understands. She she trusts you. Yeah. And one thing that really made me think uh, was what you said at one point is that uh, getting to the top is only 50%. That's right. Coming back is the other 50%. 
And I think that's a very wise thing to say. And I'm sure it comes from uh, experience, doesn't it? Yes. Experience and training. If you're paying attention to smart people, you have to remember things like that. Yes, yes. Well, we're just about out of time. The uh, the half hour went by so fast because the topic is so fascinating and you're such a, a great guest. Um, but I uh, very quickly, how do you stay in shape now? How do you train? Uh, or are you planning more climb? Well, I've always been pretty active. Just I love to ride my bicycle. I rode my bike across the country years ago and I ride it to work a lot. So I, jogging and stuff, but I, I, you ramp up a lot when you're trying to prepare for an event like Denali. Yes. After Denali, I, I drink wine. I, I brag about it to people, and I don't do very much training. <laughs> we've, been, we've been on a victory <laughs> lap for six months. And what is your next adventure? Is that a secret, or you haven't decided yet? It, there, there's no secrets. I was joking with the people in the Enterprise that, well, yes. there are 58 counties in California, and we've probably been to the top of five or six of those. So that would be a fun thing to, to do next. But, I think that's a wonderful yeah. idea. I love California and I love uh, the terrain and all the varieties. So promise me that when you get back <laughs> from all the peaks in California, you will call me and we'll have you back on Davis Media. Well, all right. When, <laughs> we'll, when we'll do the symbolic last one together, we'll do Sacramento County, which is a very easy one. Good, great, yeah, yeah. wonderful. That's that's a promise then. Well, um, thank you so much, Tim, for coming to talk to us. It is and good luck and happy new year and uh, the warmest wishes to you and your wife. Well, and thank uh, you, Lynn. You're really an inspiration for uh, uh, for us here in Davis. So it's great. So and I'm afraid we need to go. Uh, you've been watching in the studio. I'm your host, Lynn Weaver. If you'd like to watch this program again, uh, you can log on onto our website, dctv.davismedia.org. And uh, if you, um, while you're there, you might want to take a look at some of our other programs. Uh, we have uh, uh, great things on the website. You can stream them. So thank you again. Again, you've been watching In the Studio. I'm Lynn Weaver. And see you next time. Thank you.